talking about muscle fibers, okay? So the whole topic this week is muscle fibers, right? And so I'm going to talk about the lessons that are getting posted up, and then I'm going to answer all your questions live. So going into that, going on to that topic, let's get into it. Um, so first, let's talk about what are muscle fibers, right? So muscle fibers themselves are the basic unit of contraction, okay? So when, when your muscle contracts, there's several cells that make up the tissue muscle, and those cells themselves uh, are called muscle fibers, right? So, um, so they're super cool, and they do have a lot of functions, but the thing to understand is that there are different types of muscle fibers, right? So we have type one muscle fibers, some people call slow twitch, and we have type two muscle fibers, uh, some people call fast twitch, right? So type one and type two. Your type one muscle fibers are, are again, slow twitch are meant for more endurance type of events. So long duration events, um, higher repetition events, and things like that, that. They're very resistant to fatigue, slow twitch muscle fibers, and they're easy to recruit. Okay, <clears throat> your fast switch muscle fibers, on the other hand, those actually uh, are much larger in general, and they're meant for more explosive activities, heavier activities, and they don't have much endurance, right? So that's very, very important to understand. So we have slow switch meant for more endurance, uh, or meant for more higher repetition activities, they're highly fatigue resistant, and fast switch muscle fibers, which again are meant for explosive activities, more force, more power output, and they're not as fatigue resistant, okay? So, what we're gonna do is talk about, well, how do you recruit muscle fibers? How do you hypertrophy these different muscle fibers? Is there a difference between bodybuilders and power lifters? Are there different ways to direct tension on different muscle fibers? And that's what we're gonna talk about. So the first thing I want you to understand is what's called the size and fatigue principle, right? Remember, you have your brain and you have the nervous system, but also part of the nervous system, which is the spinal cord. So the brain and you have the spinal cord, right? So when you think, and I tell my muscle to contract, it sends a signal to the muscle. If I were to lift my arm up right now, remember I have the slow twitch muscle fibers which don't exert as much force and they can go a long time, but I also have the fast twitch muscle fibers which can go really fast. Now here's the thing. If I were to basically, you know, pick up this pen, it doesn't require a lot of force. So I'm gonna recruit my slow twitch, my type one muscle fibers, okay? You don't wanna recruit your fast twitch muscle fibers for everything. Because if I did, if I, I would have no control. So if this is a light object, if I had to recruit my fast twitch muscle fibers, I wouldn't be able to control my arm. It'd just fly up, right? And so the point is, I wanna be able to control my arm for slow movement. So if I'm lifting lighter weight, I'm gonna recruit the type one slow fibers. If I start, but also, if, if I, so if I lift lightweight, but I go to complete failure, I start to recruit some of the moderate fibers. So you have type one, and you have basically a little bit larger type one, uh, but I won't recruit the fast twitch fully, the type two, unless I start to go heavy. So when I lift a little bit heavier, like moderate weight, like eight to 12 reps, when I go to failure, I can actually recruit the fast switch fibers. But here's the thing to understand. On rep one, I'm not fully recruiting the fast switch fibers, but by the time I get to near failure, then I recruit them all, okay? So what I'm saying, why is that? Failure is an indication of fatigue. So there's two things that are important for recruiting your muscles. One is weight, two is fatigue. If I, if I lift a very lightweight, I might, to fatigue, I might maximally tax the type one fibers, but in order to re maximally recruit the fast switch fibers, I need to have at least moderate or, or heavy weight, and I need to go all out to fatigue, okay, which is all out to failure. So again, fatigue as well as weight are gonna dictate what you lift. So <clears throat> then you need to go to recruit the, slow twi the fast switch muscle fibers, what causes fatigue? Well, what's gonna cause fatigue essentially is going to be either one, just going all out to failure, or two, your rest period lengths. So if I have short rest period lengths, that's gonna drive up fatigue, okay? Um, if, if, I, if I actually um, use things like supersets, that's gonna drive up fatigue. So that's, that's something very to understand. So again, to recruit maximal muscle fibers, I either go to failure or lift heavier. 
The next thing that I'm going to talk about is going to talk about repetition ranges and hypertrophy. And I'm also going to talk about the difference between bodybuilders and power lifters, okay? So here's the thing. Um, studies show that for me to um, maximally uh, cause hypertrophy in the type 2 muscle fibers, the fast switch muscle fibers, I need to lift heavier weights. That's again, it's going to either be 1 to 5 reps to failure or it's going to be 8 to 12 reps to near failure or it's going to be explosive movements. Those types of activities will recruit, maximally recruit and hypertrophy the type 2 fibers. So you're going to have to lift heavy to maximally uh, stimulate growth in the fast switch fibers, okay? So like Paul over here, for example, you ever do like 5x5 five five, stuff I like that? I love 5x5. Five five. So Paul does a lot of 5x5 five five training. Uh, he's got nice large quads and he does a lot of heavy lifting with, with squats. So it is 5x5. Five five. That's going to target those fast switch muscle fibers. On the other hand, um, in order to cause hypertrophy, muscle growth in the type 1 fibers, and you go very high rep. Just because I recruit the slow twitch muscle fibers or type 1 doesn't mean I'll get hypertrophy in them. So for example, there's studies that, it, um, that look at comparing power lifters and weight lifters who are explosive and heavy lifting to bodybuilders. <clears throat> power lifters primarily get muscle growth in the type 2 muscle fibers. They don't get a lot of growth in the type 1 muscle fibers. Okay, That's because they're lifting mainly 5x5 five five or like very heavy lifting. But if you're a bodybuilder and you want to get growth in both the type 2 and type 1, you're going to need to do very high rep training. So that's where you're doing like 20 reps to failure, 30 reps to failure, giant sets. Or you're doing like 15 reps to failure, only resting 30 seconds and going back. And then only resting 30 seconds and going back. That very high rep, very short rest will target the type 1 fibers. If you just lift heavy, you will not maximize growth in both the slow and the fast fibers. Okay? So you need to have a, a combination of very high reps, 20, 30 repetitions, even 40 reps, 15 reps, and then the heavier 1 to 5, or I would say like for bodybuilding, sets of 5 or sets of 6 to 8 is going to be very heavy, and then maybe even sets of 8 to 12. So it's important that you have a variation in your repetition scheme. Okay. Next thing I'm going to talk about is for recruiting the fast switch fibers or heavy eccentric loading. So that's basically, let's say I'm going to do a bench press and Paul's pushing down on the bar on the way down. That seems to recruit particularly the fast switch muscle fibers, right? So that's one of the key is that you want to do like basically uh, heavy eccentrics to target the fast switch muscle fiber. So say I'm doing a curl and Paul's pushing down on the way down, that is going to recruit fast switch muscle fibers. So eccentric loading is a way to do that. Now last thing I'm going to talk about too is going to be where you direct tension. Uh, ben Pakulski, our good friend, uh, basically talks about like intent and directing tension. Well there's studies that basically show if I'm doing bench press and I focus on my chest, I actually get more motor unit recruitment, more muscle fiber recruitment in my chest. But if I focus on my triceps, I get more muscle activation in my triceps. So for maximizing muscle recruitment, you, you can direct tension to that muscle just by focusing on that muscle. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of an overview of, of this. Let me go ahead and just sum this up. Right. Two different muscle fiber types. You have type 1, which is uh, um, targeted by very high repetitions, anything past 15 repetitions and uh, short rest, 30 to 60 seconds. Those are meant for more high repetition activities and more endurance or fatigue resistant. You have the type two, which are uh, also, which are very large and they're meant for explosive activity, heavy lifting, high force. To target them, you're gonna lift probably anywhere from five to 12 repetitions. You might rest longer anywhere from two to four minutes. You can also do explosive movements. That will also target the fast switch muscle fibers, okay? Um, so in order to maximally recruit all the fibers, again, you can use weight or you can also use fatigue. So even if you're using a light weight, if you go to failure, you recruit more larger muscle fibers. Finally, if you use, excuse me, not finally, but eccentric loading, heavy eccentric loading, cause you to recruit the fast switch muscle fibers um, selectively. And then finally, you can direct motor unit recruitment by just focusing on uh, a specific muscle group. So if I'm doing bench press, 
If I focus more on the chest, I'll get more muscle activation in that region. Um, <clears throat> so that's a summary, guys. Now I'm going to go ahead and take um, your questions and answers. Go ahead and fire away. We got one over here on the, the Facebook to start with. Could you recruit or use both um, type 1 and type 2 in a training program on the same day, or do you recommend trying to train type 1 and then the next day train type 2? So I recommend that I would do both. So some days I would use them both, like do uh, heavy train, but always start with heavy training to start and then burn out with high rep training. Uh, John George in our lab did a study where he did combine the heavy and high rep training and actually uh, saw more gains than when you did them separately. But in the same token, uh, there's something to switching things up. So you can separate those days too and just have a heavy day and a hypertrophy day. But if you have a heavy day and you want to also recruit the slow twitch fibers, maybe add a burnout in there. So I think, yeah, doing them both. <clears throat> okay. Um, can you build muscle and size through isometric holds? So Matthew, um, isometric holds is not going to be your best way to build muscle, but the guy who originated that um, basically, uh, you know, he, he, you can gain muscle doing isometric holds. It's just not going to optimize things. I think it was Charles Atlas. Charles Atlas actually came out with a book probably like, man, 60 years ago or something. And his whole thing was on isometrics. So he literally used isometric holds for everything. And he actually, for his day, he gained a lot of muscle. So yeah, isometric lifting can gain, you can gain muscle, but you don't get a lot of muscle damage doing isometrics. So you're not gonna optimize muscle growth by doing that. So I, I would say isometric's not ideal, but in conjunction with normal training, I do think it will increase growth. So if, I'm doing, if I do a set, and then in between my set, I'm keeping the muscle flexed and tense, I can actually trap that metabolic stress in the muscle, and that will add muscle growth. So isometrics in between sets, meaning like intraset flexing, can increase muscle growth. And Arnold did that all the time as part of the priority principle, and it worked. Are all the muscle parts a combination of type 1 and type 2 fibers? Yes, that's Arrestus. Yeah, all the muscle, all muscle groups have a combination, but they differ, right? So in general for example it seems that like if you look at the lower body the lower body like the more like the um the flexors of the lower body like the hamstrings the the calf muscles those tend to be a little bit more slow twitch than fast twitch um but if you look at for example like the glutes they're about 50 50. if you look at the quads on the other hand they're a little bit more fast twitch dominant and the upper body seems to be more slightly more fast twitch dominant. So for example, like the triceps and the biceps are about 60% fast twitch. So when you're training the upper body, you may need to do a, veer a little bit more towards heavy lifting, but the lower body, you may be able to get more growth with some, especially with the hamstrings and glutes, with some of the higher rep lifts. Um, muscle fiber activation during blood flow restriction training, mostly type one. That's Matt's Holst. Um, uh, Andy, basically to answer your question, Mats, um, if you do um, blood flow restriction and you're under 30% of your 1RM, you'll recruit in, in hypertrophy mainly the type 1 fibers. If you get over 40% of your 1RM, 50 or at 50% of your 1RM, you'll hypertrophy type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. So basically with blood flow restriction, if you're over 40%, you hit type 1 and type 2. If you're under 40%, you're primarily hypertrophy and type 1. Um, so what is the most fun rate of the abdominals? They're mainly fast twitch. So yeah, train them heavy. Let's train them heavy. Um, okay. Was that answered? Yeah, that was answered. Intercept stretching, does it help or, um, or post exercise to cool down? Intercept stretching will cause muscle growth. Post set post exercise stretching is just more of a mobility thing. I don't think it's going to cause much growth, but our lab is going to intercept stretching actually and uh, causes uh, muscle growth. Alexand um, Alexandro uh, says, "Does BFR contribute to muscle hyperplasia?" Alexandro, um, two things cause hyperplasia. For you guys who don't know, hyperplasia is increasing muscle fibers. And basically, while it's controversial, I do think you can do it. Two things that are going to cause that. 
one is going to be um, high amounts of muscle damage. BFR is not going to give you the muscle damage. But B blood flow restriction will give you the growth factors, and the growth factors can also cause hyperplasia. So to get hyperplasia, I'd say you need to lift heavy and cause a lot of muscle damage and then burn out with blood flow restriction. That'll give you your best shot. That's cool. Um, let's see. Kind of my muscle connection. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so Ben Pakulski recommends workout plans with really short rest. For example, squats with 30 to 40 seconds rest and so on. How does it fit muscle building? Okay, so uh, Mik Mikkel, that's a really good question, or Michael, it's a really good question. Ben's taking advantage of fatigue. Remember, the more fatigue you have, the greater the muscle uh, fiber recruitment. Short rest period lengths, even with lighter weight, you recruit faster twitch muscle fibers. So I think it's a good technique. Um, evidence. Have you seen practical evidence for hyperplasia in humans? Um, the, here's the issue. Um, for Again, biggest thing on hyperplasia in humans is that when they have done um, studies, basically, where they, they, they um, look at uh, cross-sectional area or they, they take a biopsy of uh, elite bodybuilders and compare them to like normal people. And oftentimes the elite bodybuilders will show a lot of muscle fibers that aren't bigger than um, the, the untrained people. Now, given the fact that they've trained a long time, that says, oh, why are all of their muscle fibers should be hypertrophied if they've been training that long? But if some aren't, it may be indicative of hyperplasia having taken place. Um, and so I think that's the biggest evidence for humans. But you have to understand that we can't, it, in animals, like when I used to do uh, research in grad school, I could take muscle fibers out and count them all. But in humans, I can't take your whole bicep out and count all the muscle fibers and see how training impacted that. So the main point about that is that um, when you're talking about like hyperplasia, with humans it's hard to quantify. But in every animal on earth that's been looked at, you see hyperplasia. So why would it not happen with humans? Recovery time for type 1 and type 2, is there a difference? Type 1 fibers recover faster than type 2. So like if you go heavier, it may be longer to recover than if I went uh, high rep. And then recovery again, off week, do you recommend? Uh, as far as like recovery, I don't recommend taking a week off. But I do recommend like using tapers, for example, where you lower your training volume by 50 to 80% and keep your intensity high. Let's see. Hey, Doc, I thought there was this all or nothing law for muscle fiber recruitment in motor units. How is, that, how is it that we can buy a certain muscle fiber types? Anthony Poon, that's a really good question. The all or none principle, first off, let me say this. The all or principle is basically like either you activate a muscle fiber or you don't, right? But again, now that's a muscle fiber, okay? So if you look functionally within even the biceps, there are functional compartments in the biceps to where if I change the angle of movement that I'm going at, whether it's here, here, or here, your nervous system will recruit different populations or different compartments of that muscle, okay? So in other words, all the biceps is not necessarily uniformly activated, and there's evidence of that. So when we do hypertrophy studies, hypertrophy is non-uniform across the belly of the muscle and even across the length of the muscle oftentimes, depending on what you're looking at. So what that suggests is that, is that hypertrophy does not occur uniformly. Um, Dr. Jose Antonio did a good paper, actually, I think it was in 2000 in Journal of Strength Conditioning Research. He published a great paper on non-uniform hypertrophy in muscles and showed like almost every body part, non-uniform meaning that hypertrophy is not equal across the muscle or even sometimes along the length of the muscle. So that indicates that r and principle is just simplistic. That's basically like, all right, I'm grabbing this bottle and I keep pressing it harder and harder and harder, you know, and then I might... I either fully recruit all my muscles or I don't. I don't think it's that simple. So, um, but anyway, going on targeting different muscle fibers, uh, even if you do recruit type one fibers, does not mean they'll hypertrophy. To hypertrophy them, you have to recruit them and fatigue them like they haven't been fatigued before. Whereas fascist muscle fibers, you just need to really recruit them 
and maybe damage them. So I hope that answers the question. As a runner, 10K plus, what do you suggest to incorporate lifting into my program re regimen? I'm pretty lean and concerned about losing muscle mass. Well, you do, the more you, the more endurance you do, Stephen, the more muscle you do lose. So for you, you're going to want to keep your intensity high for your training, uh, especially when you're doing like endurance. So keep your volume low and that will minimize muscle loss. As far as resistance training, heavy lifting and power training will help your 10K the most. It seems to make you more economical. It makes your tendons more stiff. And so you use less energy for any given run. Yep. Lower body reacts to higher reps. So does HIT build muscle as well? Well, HIT is a lot of high reps. If you think about it, you're getting a ton of reps. If you do 30 second sprints, a ton of repetitions. But yeah, our labs found HIT caused a lot of hypertrophy. Would there be any negative effects on muscle growth um, if you did a heavy lift session, then swam for 20 minutes post session, uh, yeah, there would. That would probably interfere with your lifting. Um, <clears throat> what do you think about Tom Platt's training style? He said high reps and heavy weights for maximal growth. What do you think about that? Uh, plus drop sets if necessary to drain the muscle even more. Uh, Franco, Tom Platt's hit the nail on the head. So he went heavy, but Tom Platt's also did like 20 rep squats, 30 rep squats. So he was maximally targeting both the fast switch and slow switch muscle fibers. He also did short rest period lengths. Like you said, burnouts. And his quads were enormous. So it's a perfect example of how fatigue and heavy lifting could target both muscle fibers. I think it's a great idea. Hey Doc, you said that BFR affects muscle fibers type one and type two when we do, we use 50% of one RM. What rep range do you suggest? Um, Sp Spiros, I recommend basically um, your basic thing is going to be anywhere from like 15 to 30 repetitions on BFR training. Yes. Um, have you tried EMS, electrostimulation, during to exercise to recruit muscle fibers? Yeah, we actually have for you fit the, um, the technology in our lab. And you'll see that when you watch Generation Iron 2. Um, you know, we use that on Santos. We use that on, uh, um, you know a lot of guys in, in our lab laboratory. But I think the main thing to understand is yes, it works. I think that it, that E-STEM plus resistance training will cause some of the biggest growth gains you've ever gotten in your life. Um, okay. And some books. Can I recommend some basic books for strength training and size? Uh, look out pretty soon for us. We're going to be launching some crazy stuff. Just, just hold on. As far as basic books, I mean... I mean, I don't know. Is it, it, not like a lot of great textbooks out there on that. How? Well, Either way. Okay. How long can you go without a consistent amount of protein and aminos before you become catabolic? I mean, technically, you start to become catabolic like in like four hours. But again, you need to look at like, um, you really need to think about like this. If I go catabolic for a longer period of time, say I haven't eaten in eight hours. Your muscle, there's evidence that it may rebound and be super anabolic after, okay? So it's very tricky. But I would say, you know, in about, um, actually my brother's dissertation showed that after about three hours, you stop, you stop three or four hours. Range of motor right there. Is there a difference in muscle fiber act, uh, um, activation in terms of range of motion? Yeah, because here's the thing. Say I'm doing, for example, squats, and I have on the bar... Um, Let's say I have the bar 300 pounds. Now, say I do a half a repetition, okay? And then I follow that up with a full repetition. The full repetition will actually recruit more muscle because mechanically I'm at a disadvantage on the bottom of the lift, therefore I have to recruit more muscle fibers. So yes, uh, going full range of motion will recruit the faster twitch muscle fibers, whereas going partial range of motion, you're not fully recruiting them all. <clears throat> what about type 2A and type 2B muscle fibers? So, Rube, so type, basically, going, that's very, we're, now we're going to, it's advanced. We have type 1 and type 2, and there's different subtypes of type 2. We generally break those down into type 2A and 2X in humans, type 2A and type 2B in rats. Um, but the 2X are the highest, the, the hardest to recruit, and they're the largest and strongest. The type 2A are like intermediate between type 1 and type 2. Thing to understand is that when, when I'm well trained, all my type 2X, which are the largest, recruit to type 2, 
convert over to type 2A. So most of you guys who have been training a long time primarily have type 1 and type 2A fibers. So if you're untrained, you have more type 1, 2A, and 2X. But once you recruit the 2X, they convert over to 2A anyway. So, um, so I hope that answers your question. Right. <clears throat> what is your opinion on occlusion training for bodybuilding purposes? I think it's a, a great tool. Danny, was it? Um, how many more questions do you think? Let's do two more. Two more. Yep. Back to tapering on training volume. This is from Lassie. When training hard and often, five days a week, how often should you taper? When you feel li like it? Okay, so uh, wh what about your nervous system? Okay, good question. Lastly, I like to program and tapering in. There's two ways that you can do it. One's approach called step loading. Step loading, essentially, you start with a moderate load. I mean, say volume, moderate volume. Say you're doing six sets per body part. Next week, say, then you go, uh, that's low volume. Then you go to moderate volume. So you go from six sets to, uh, to 12 sets per body part. Then week three, you go to 18 sets. And then week four, you taper and maybe go to like five, four to five sets of body part. In that case, you're programming in a step load. You step up and you step, and then you step down. You're tapering every four weeks. I think that's a good method. Now, as far as perceived recovery, on a scale of zero to 10, we found that essentially you want to keep your perceived recovery anywhere from seven to, t seven to ideally 10. If you see yourself fall to like a five or a four, you need to taper. So your perceive if it's consistently like a five, that's a problem. You can hit a point and over no return and really overtrain and overreach. So if you start hitting perceived recovery on a scale of zero to ten, you start you see consistently five to sixes, you need to taper. Last one. Okay. Oh, real quick. So this is a good one. Yeah. Anthony Poon goes, Hey Doc, have you ever thought of lecturing in units? Uh, e.g. muscle PhD. <laughs> oh, interesting. So I pulled it up. Uh, Anthony, great question. To answer your question, yes, and stay tuned because we're literally going to create something that will be one of the most phenomenal education. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going to be everything you need to know. Everything you need to know about muscle. I love you.